And now I give the floor to Harald Epinoz, uh, ex Executive Director of Institute for Advanced Judicial Studies um, remotely from France, who will represent the PEJ. Uh, ideas and recommendations, including uh, in declarations, so on, uh, and, and Harold's uh, speech will be about lessons learned and challenges faced by the judiciary during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So please, Harold, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, e-conference Closing European Project on Judicial Cooperation in Criminal Matters, um, a conference that I'm attending remotely uh, from Paris, France, as it has been said. Looking forward to the next occasion to be with you in Riga again, or to visit for the first time Vilnius or Zagreb. Uh, I think we, we now really miss these travels across beautiful Europe, as I agree with the people who answered that in the, in the uh, survey we, we just had. Uh, let me uh, just uh, load my presentation. So that you can have the slides available on your screen. I hope it works well for you. Well, you uh, asked me to talk about the, the recent events. It was very, very interesting to hear about your uh, own experience, uh, the personal experience and the professional experience of the pandemic in the, in the survey. Uh, the unexpected sanitary crisis we, we faced in uh, 2020 and the global pandemic we are still under today have been indeed impacting the, the functioning not our, uh, of our uh, everyday lives only, but uh, of our judicial systems, our professions. Um, something, a judicial system, which is already a complex organization, as the picture here suggests, you know, with multiple flow of information relying on, on different infrastructures. And among others, it impacted, I'm sure, our ability to cooperate between courts of Europe. It is what uh, you are discussing today. This is your topic of the day in criminal matters, but of course, in other areas as well, the functioning of the justice systems have been impacted, as you know. National courts have been um, suddenly uh, caught in a series of measures disturbing their traditional organization and had to invent in a rush or accelerate their transformation into what we may call a 21st century delivery of justice services. And in that context, as we all know, technology played a large role in supporting courts for the maintenance of their operations, or largely missed to courts that were not equipped with the right technology to maintain their operations in this new and unexpected context. So what are the, the lessons learned from the experience of the pandemic and the challenges faced by your court systems? To answer this question, the CEPEJ, the European Commission for the Efficiency of the Judiciary from the Council of Europe, set up a, a one-day seminar remotely in June 2020, in which CEPEJ members' representatives shared their experience of the sanitary crisis that was affecting the functioning of justice in their respective countries. You can still watch the videos online of CEPEJ website uh, uh, from this meeting, among other sources of information that have been collected and provided by the member states at this occasion. A meeting that resulted in a declaration of June the 10th that I will commence uh, later. If I had to summarize this conversation the CEPEJ members had, I would say that basically they gave testimony of how almost everywhere the justice system received a slap in the face and has been under the same pressure, more or less, uh, to organize an answer first. An urgent reaction to the eruption of the sanitary crisis in the ordinary functioning of the courts, seen as one factor among others in the dissemination of the pandemic. Second, a rapid adaptation of court activities to an exceptional situation in which physical contacts had to be limited or prohibited for a certain and unknown amount of time. And third, a necessity to resume, to resume the work of the courts to a level close to normal or invent what could be a new normal when time came to look at the close future. 
So I want to make a, a catalog of which country did what exactly. It could be too long and somehow boring, but I would rather uh, summarize the main ideas coming from these findings from the CEPESH collection of information and exchanges during this June 2020 meeting, leading to the declaration of the same day, especially regarding the new practices that emerged from the crisis. So looking at what happened in these first six months of the pandemic, just one year ago, taking into consideration that the legislations and regulations governments thought were, were appropriate to provide an urgent response to the situation. So different justice systems had to face the same series of questions and assume their decision to embark in a new management practices area that involved a massive use of information technology that we can present in four steps. First steps, the complexity to mobilize in a rush and to coordinate a mix of competent authorities to adapt the functioning of the course to an urgent situation. This is to say legislative and regulatory authorities to set up the principles in coordination with judicial authorities, having to implement concrete measures in the field and make this a reality. In that context, um, countries having a, a classical top-down model of governance for courts had to decide about the appropriate regulation once for all in a black or white mode and probably missed the possibility to offer a better qualitative response by not taking into consideration enough the specificities of big cities, suburbs, rural areas, providing a solution that would fit for all cases, but that did not. Those to the contrary who enjoyed a more flexible governance model, uh, a model in which heads of courts have more prerogatives to express their needs and regulate the functioning of their jurisdiction day to day, and even better when they have a forum in place in which to discuss about justice administration with partners like bar associations. Well, this one, they managed the dilemma pretty well, or at least better, playing with the grayscale solutions available, mitigating between the interruption or continuation of services in a better awareness of the needs and capacity of their respective population from the ground, the professionals involved and the citizens. In that context, we also see that countries who have an efficient system to appeal a decision in front of a superior or a supreme or a constitutional court and are in position to give an answer in a very short delay where, without surprise, better controlling the possible damages provoked by the system that was being put in place and were also better protecting the rights of the citizens. Second step was to adapt the legal system and the justice delivery to a situation of limited and prohibited uh, physical contacts. And that is precisely when the ID came to uh, rely on digital infrastructures instead of physical infrastructures that were not available anymore or not entirely. In the case, the physical infrastructures could not accommodate anymore the full delivery of justice services or put people at a high level of risk for their health. But the reality was that in, in most countries, including among the richest ones, digital infrastructures were not properly in place to support that switch, that radical and big switch, and large majority of them had to experiment and mostly improvise a variety of situations after the decision was taken to go digital by default. An area in which digital by default, available research shows that for a long time now in countries that have been starting to use remote justice for a certain period in certain areas, research showed that a series of questions have been have to be uh, solved prior to go digital. Let, let's quote a few of them, two of them. First issue, Availability, quality, and compatibility of equipments, both hardware and software for all, which are not less important than the attention we pay to our physical environments in terms of accessibility, of security, of functionalities, and user-friendly principles. IT frameworks in place and procurement rules were critical also for countries who suddenly had to develop digital work and spray out digital equipments in a short delay. Second issue, and, and not a minor one, questions of new protocols and rituals to consider in the digital environment, which are also essential to the matter, not only to the professionals involved, but to the parties as well. As you can imagine, in countries where these protocols and rituals were not in place and shared by the justice community as a whole, improvisation again was the rule and led to a series of misunderstandings and inefficiencies uh, 
and to um, illegalities sometimes as well. This, as you can imagine, are issues that cannot be properly solved in such a rush. They need time for a substantial work, design, consultation, training before you decide to go entirely digital. Third step, after reorganizing in a rush the new work conditions, has been to select disputes likely to be handled by the court in order to relieve the pressure on the judicial system, the rest being postponed to better days. Selecting um, among the services which ones should be maintained and for the adjudication area, which cases should get the priority in courts exactly as they did in hospitals. In every country, priority was merely given to criminal cases, especially for Willis decisions or situation in which it is considered there is an emergency like in family law, domestic violence, especially children protection. Probably it was the case in cross-border criminal matters as well, unless the cases have not been given a priority in your jurisdiction, I don't know really. Uh, concerning the other matters that were not falling under this level of priority cases, some flexibility was consequently given to procedural deadlines for the parties and delays extended for adjudicating the case, considering special times and exceptional measures will not undermine the right to have your case dealt in a reasonable time, which is the provision of Article 6 of the European Convention. Fourth step and last step, the use of teleworking. We've talked about teleworking just a few minutes ago in the survey. Uh, for the purpose of developing court continuity plans, and it was thus explored sometime for the first time, the instant communication means provided to court professionals were seen as a solution to allow effective access to justice for the users, but did not always provide effective conditions for the preparation of a case. A situation that may have resulted in decisions of less relevance, less quality, and in the future, a possible increase in the appellate rate against these decisions taken during the pandemic, when appeal against these decisions is possible. In such a context, uh, the lack of appropriate solutions for all participants in the justice chain was a concern almost everywhere for temple equipments for judges, prosecutors, and court staff with access to the full case management system, access to the fine and evidence at distance for the attorneys, remote exchanges to submit legal acts. Well, other examples, the extension or generalization of the use of video conferencing has been seen as a solution where legal framework were in place and the other countries had to invent one, again, in a rush, in order to maintain a calendar of hearings and for the parties, their right to appear before a judge in for sure a degraded mode in which rights of the defense were not really possible to exercise properly in several countries, including the necessity to have a dedicated and secured communication channel between the attorney and the client during the hearing and the possibility to of uh, public scrutiny on the adjudication of these cases that was not made possible. Unfortunately, countries were not attracted by the idea of improvising something like a live broadcast of these remote hearings, but still public scrutiny was hard to maintain and justice beyond closed doors happened frequently here and there during that period. As we can see with the sanitary measures taken and imposed here and there as a consequence of the pandemic, the justice system has had more or less to face the same challenge, solving a dilemma that we could summarize as to close or not to close not only the courts as physical infrastructure, but the justice service delivery. The solution as the time has been, it is better to provide a service in a degraded mode rather than no service at all. The question for now is, are we ready to learn about the risks we have taken during that period and cover these kinds of risks for the future? Have we learned about the mistakes we have made or may have made and are we one ready to repair them if they have caused prejudice to prevent they do not happen again in the future by building a resilient and sustainable justice system using especially more digital solutions in its daily operations but without the risk we incurred. What we have been under with the pandemic is an alert to take the digital transformation of courts seriously. <laughs> The majority of countries that had to experiment their court operations remotely suddenly put at test their what we call at CEPESH cyber justice environment, referring precisely to the guidelines on how to support change to digital justice systems, a document of 2016. 
In addition to the guidelines, those countries now have a recent critical assessment on their desk, the result of a stress test with the pandemic, with this specific experience of the crisis that leads to an in-depth analysis and possibly a future strategy for relevant development of IT and justice, taking advantage of the unique benchmark of European experiences and, again, some research available to help them. In order to support this development of IT, and a bunch of new practices in respect of the values and principles developed by the Council of Europe, the CEPEJ, with its June meeting, has produced a declaration named Lessons Learned and Challenges Faced by Judiciary During and After the COVID-19 Pandemic, a declaration based on the findings I have just summarized. So what this declaration says, I won't read it for you from the beginning to the end, the declaration is available online in English and also in Latvian, I've been told, but I will rather comment around it. The declaration actually contains seven principles that I would like to mention because some interesting points on where our court system are going or maybe going now come from analysis of the blanks in this particular experience of the pandemic. Principle one, respect of human rights and rule of law for which the declaration says it is not an option in a pandemic context, it is still an obligation of the member states. Provision of a fair trial is still the standard on one side that is a target, and the courts have a special and important role to play in the review of the emergency measures on the other end, so they need to uh, still uh, online. Meaning full closure of courts is not an option either. Principle two, access to justice. Principle two about access to justice mentions the necessity to develop greater consultation and coordination with all justice professionals, including lawyers, enforcement agents, mediators, social services. We've talked about that already, this necessary consultation. A priority to be given to vulnerable groups, even more vulnerable in the situation of a pandemic, like in domestic violence or children again, but also resulting from the pandemic consequences like urgent economic or housing situations, a priority that is not in the interest of the caseload of the court, but in the interest of the people we serve. Principle three, safety of persons, of course, shall not be ignored, but maintained within a high level of exigence. We actually don't expect court professionals to become martyrs, but that may need again appropriate investment from the authority that funds the courts or technological support with the developments of teleworking. Principle four, Monitoring case flow, quality, and performance. Well, um, the idea here that whatever and how bad your results may be, if you look at your statistics, it would be worse to ignore the situation and continue to act as if your court was not impacted by the crisis. To the contrary, you need precise and detailed statistics to manage your case load properly. Decide about the priorities we've talked about, you know, with informed decisions and provide the best service possible based on objective criteria or at least the less bad services taking into account the circumstances, but at least maintaining a quality of treatment for the people you serve. Principle five, here it comes, cyber justice as a solution with its own risks. In principle uh, five about the, the development of cyber justice solutions, the declaration encourages the parallel development of legal basis, including the online procedures, as well as, as well, uh, the, the data security protection. You know, the idea here is to have a, a legal framework in place for the new practices that have been emerging, developing during the past year, and no deal possible but solutions to reinvent the digital environment with the principles of the fair trial again. Principle six, training. Principle six about training is absolutely right to insist on the necessity to have all professionals trained and citizens of course users aware of this new kind of justice delivery, not forgetting that we are not equal in front of this digital revolution. Principle seven, and as a conclusion, is entitled forward-looking justice, or in other words, it is urgent to make your justice system a learning organization, as it was mentioned in the previous slide. Among the new practices we had to introduce or, or generalize in a year, an assessment shall be made now, I guess, to analyze their real potential in the long term, because they have some, their impact, I'm sure they have some, and how sustainable these solutions are. That means also that there's a condition for generalization with the risks or threats that these new practices may bring to your organization, your court, or your court system. 
In a nutshell, and to conclude with this presentation, what CEPEJ work shows here in this collection of information and with the declaration, I think, is that we still have a long way to develop a consistent system of justice of the post-COVID-19 pandemic era, and maybe not so much time before this new face of justice, to quote the title of this famous book by Damashka, uh, that this new face of our justice system is developing more and more and becomes the new normal. Sepej, I guess, is right to remind us with the declaration that principles should continue to drive the transformation of our justice systems, especially in this period of uncertainty, because it is beyond the current crisis, I think, the real future here to say that we are building. Thank you again for your invitation and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Harald, very much. So do we have questions by the out time? We'll do, yes, let's admit. Do we have any questions? If you can just unmute your uh, microphone and ask the question if you have any. Uh, Jans Baumans. Yes, uh, thank you. I wanted to ask my French colleague. In France, when you have a remote proceeding, a remote hearing, when a witness, for example, is using the Zoom to provide uh, testimony remotely, does the court have to check? Do they have the duty to check where the witness is located in France or Germany, or, or it doesn't really matter where the victim is located? What about the jurisdiction? Any conflicts in this regard? Well, thank you for this question. Yeah, actually, we, we, we have experienced uh, remote witnesses, uh, video conferencing for, for some time, not in all matters, but it, it's quite often from a detention center or for uh, any remote location. Um, however, we don't have a, a consistent practice of this. I mean, there are still uh, some improvements uh, and we have uh, especially uh, facing, we had to face this uh, challenge during the pandemic to uh, generalize the system. We had uh, an ecosystem of some professionals used to that practice, but that was not meant to be generalized uh, both on the technical side, you know, with the tool available, uh, Zoom, uh, Teams, or whatever uh, tool you can imagine that from, from one day to another had to be used in, in a very, at a very large scale. But m more precisely, we didn't have uh, a, a consistent protocol, exactly what you mentioned, how to really conduct a hearing, how to make sure that the lawyers have the right uh, and effective possibility to ask for some checks, you know, if you have someone um, in a remote location, you are probably interesting not only to see his or her face, but what or who is behind, or I don't know, you know, all, all the, the general environment that you, you, you don't process with these uh, screen arrangements. So um, like in, in many countries, uh, we, we, we had an experiment, but we were not ready to jump into generalization and especially because the experiment we had because of matter of emergencies were in very serious operations with release of prisoners, with uh, decisions to, case, to, to, to take, as I mentioned, in, in children or, or domestic violence. So it, it was, I would say, uh, quite, uh, quite a mess and also a rush to improvise. Uh, and it was unfortunately in many countries, I guess. Thank you, Paldesian. Thank you, Harold. So do you have any more questions, Harold? Okay, so if you have uh, more questions, you can type it in a chat and uh, Harold um, will have a time to answer uh, those questions there. Thank you very much.